Okay, good afternoon. My name is Mike Stanton. I'm the head of uh, strategy and communications at Build America Mutual. BAM is a longtime partner of the National League of Cities. Uh, we're the uh, preferred provider of bond insurance for members of the National League of Cities. And we're really glad to be here with our colleagues uh, from NLC, as well as uh, from the municipal market, to talk about resilient infrastructure, learn more about the needs uh, among cities for these investments and how the municipal bond market may be able to help. Our two speakers today are experts in the field. Farhad Omir uh, from the National League of Cities is the head of research and is uh, the lead researcher on the uh, annual city fiscal conditions and state of the cities report and has put together some very uh, unique uh, uh, research that he's going to discuss for the first time in today's uh, conference, uh, today's webinar on municipal infrastructure conditions and how resiliency is, is rising to the uh, forefront of, of uh, cities' long-term capital planning needs. And then we're going to hear from Robert Pattison. Uh, Robert Pattison is executive director and co-head of the public sector group for Morgan Stanley. Uh, and he worked on a, a very interesting transaction in the resilience field, a $349 million sale of sustainability bonds for the Battery Park City Authority here in New York, which is actually where I sit right now. Uh, and that was to help harden and fortify the area's coastline against storm surges and other flooding uh, potentially from rising sea levels. So he'll discuss that in a few minutes. Before we dive into the content uh, specifically on resilient infrastructure, I just want to set the stage by giving uh, the group a little more background on the municipal bond market. Um, one thing that's very important to recognize is that states and cities are where the rubber meets the road in terms of public infrastructure investment in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure in Congress, but, but when you talk about where the money is spent, more than 90% of all uh, construct public construction spending over the last decade has been done at the city and state local uh, level. And the money to do that uh, comes from the municipal bond market. If you take a look at the uh, chart on the right, that takes that will take a look at the total construction spending over the last decade, just a shade under three trillion dollars, and shows that new money municipal bond sales accounted for about seventy percent of that. So the municipal bond market is a very deep, flexible market. It finances everything from sidewalks, uh, local water and sewer systems, schools and city hall buildings, to airports, uh, power plants, and other large infrastructure. So extremely flexible and extremely well suited to the needs of state and local governments doing this work. When you take a look at the trends over the last 10 years, you can see that through 2021, there was a very strong uptrend in net investment in infrastructure across the country. That's tapered off a little bit in the last couple of years, but you can see that uh, total levels remain well above anything that was uh, seen before COVID in the previous decade. And we're off to a very strong start so far in 2024. Year to date, new money municipal bond sales, so bonds being sold for new investments, are up 11%. Um, so the market, again, maintains this flexibility and is being looked to uh, by issuers across the country to finance uh, projects. One other important thing to note is that voter support for bond issues is extremely strong. In uh, nine, in, sorry, last year in 2023, more than 80 percent of all bond referendums that were submitted to voters, and that was more than 100 billion dollars worth of borrowing, were approved. Uh, just about 20 uh, billion were uh, were turned down by voters. So you can see that uh, the public still believes very strongly in investment in infrastructure and is willing to support that with their votes and ultimately with their tax dollars because they see these as long-term investments that frankly cost less to do now than they will cost to, to try to fix in the future. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Farhad and we can dive a little bit into this new research. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me today. It's great to be with you. And as you mentioned, so... Uh, this is the first time since we did this research, actually, I'm discussing this with the public, knowing that the re full release of the report will be this Friday. So unfortunately, I was not able to uh, provide a link for your audience today for uh, actually downloading the report because the report is not out, uh, out yet. So this Friday, I ask that uh, your audience, please look forward to the full release and you can just download it from the uh, NLC web page. It, you should be able to actually look at it on the front page of nlc.org. So, uh, yeah. We'll make sure we also uh, provide that via email to everybody who's registered for the- That uh, sounds perfect. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Mike. And if so, I just interrupt you one more second before I let you go, sure. just uh, for the audience's sake, the Q&A panel is open. If you have any questions as we go along, please enter them in there. We'll address them at the end of the discussion. Perfect. All right, so with that out of the way, let's uh, dig deeper into what we found actually in this year's, this, this second year of municipal infrastructure condition. This year, me and my team, basically, we focused solely on resiliency and infrastructure resilience, basically, given the state of events 
currently in the global events, basically, with regard to global warming, right? So we ask governments what is, with regard to climate change and global warming, what effects, uh, what hazards are actually most predominant when it comes to overall in the United States and local governments. And stormwater flooding followed by extreme weathers were the two main uh, climate hazards experienced by our uh, um, survey governments, basically. When we asked about the type of government, type of infrastructure most affected by these uh, climate hazards, water and sewer systems mm -hmm and transportations were the two main categories of infrastructure most affected and vulnerable to climate change. So um, this is not, of course, what we expected to realize and understand when we did this research, but this is unfortunate, but, but rightly so. Resiliency and infrastructure resiliency has is not yet on top of priorities for local governments, at least the surveyed governments in our sample, right? Only 24% of responding cities use climate data in capital budgeting planning actively, and 70% have not conducted a climate risk assessment of their infrastructure. One thing of note here is we surveyed the same sample of governments for this piece of research that we always do for city fiscal condition or a state of the city, other flagship reports that we provide here at National League of Cities. Surprisingly, the response rate for this re report actually was much lower. As you can see when you download the full report, you will see the, 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 the uh, response rate for this piece of research was much lower. And that's telling. As we will see later on in the couple of slides, this is a still gaining traction. Resiliency at local level is a still gaining traction. And maybe at this point, I'm glad we did this research, but that reminds me of a discussion we had with uh, a colleague of mine actually from ICMA. They did similar research with some similar theme a couple of years ago they came to the same conclusion that the response rate when we are discussing resiliency of infrastructure is a little lower than when we ask other questions. So with that out of the way, can we go to the next slide now? All right, so it was obvious that government, right, right from the get-go, we knew that we should ask this question, why governments are not more involved with a uh, resiliency aspect of infrastructure in their budgeting and planning for infrastructure, right? There should be barriers and obstacles. And we were right. The most important barrier is lack of funding, despite BIL, despite all the help that governments are receiving, lack of funding is still first and foremost, the most important uh, barrier for entrance into this discussion for governments, followed by implementation capacity, which is not at all surprising to me because majority of we, we sample, we basically surveyed NLC membership. So NLC members are, we have more than 2,700 member cities from across the country, and they are a good representative sample of municipal governments here in America, meaning majority of governments are smaller populated areas compared to Chicago's of the world or New York City's of the world, right? So implementation capacity we knew would be one of the biggest barriers basically, and the data actually shows that. Regulatory and policy challenges. This, this was also mentioned by uh, a lot of governments as, a, as, as an obstacle. Basically, what a state mandates for local governments has a lot to do with how, how ready they are at this point when it comes to resilience of their infrastructure and having support when it comes to these matters. Lack of public awareness was surprisingly also mentioned by a lot of governments. When I asked on an anecdotal note, when I talked with a couple of these governments, this seems to be the next obstacle 
these governments are ready to tackle. Basically, talking more with the, with the public to, to the point of benefits of resiliency, if that makes sense. Lack of funding, as I mentioned, was the most important obstacle. But at least the good news, the silver lining here is that 67% of our surveyed cities are planning to apply for federal grants before fiscal year 25-26, meaning the next fiscal year, basically. And the more governments apply and get grants from state and local governments, the more they will be ready to tackle these issues. All right, so uh, this should be uh, my final slides. And we asked governments, all right, so you told us about your uh, hassles, they, your, your obstacles and challenges and all of that, but where do you see growth opportunity? Majority are relying on their local capital and operating budget. One thing of note here, you started this session, Mike, talking about the importance of municipal bonds. But let's not forget that municipal bonds are more accessible to larger communities where the capacity is there, right? However, our sample is majority are skewed toward smaller communities. So this is why majority of our sampled governments actually are relying more on operating and capital budgets, basically their tax revenues. When asked which other organizations are more often um, partnering with your city, your governments, MPOs, meaning metropolitan planning organizations and counties were the two major organizational bodies helping cities when it comes to planning and uh, strategizing basically for infrastructure resiliency. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mike, and we will wait for questions at the end, of course. Thanks. So uh, two things. First off, I'd just like to, to clarify a point. So I, I think your point about access to the municipal bond market is really important. I will say that the muni market, you know, smaller communities do have very strong access to the muni market. And, and at the risk of talking my book, um, part of that is because of the availability of bond insurance. If you take a look at the average transaction size uh, of the more than 5,000 uh, municipalities, mostly counties, cities, school districts that Build America uh, has worked with over the past 10 years, our average transaction size is 16 million and, and uh, the median is even less than 10 million. So uh, you take a look at that and you see that, you know, it is a very flexible market that extends capital availability to uh, communities of all sizes. So something to keep in mind that that uh, as, as you're planning, that should not be an obstacle uh, to your internal planning, that that's, that's certainly an option for almost every community in the country. Um, one thing I did think was really interesting in what you said was, it's, it's fascinating to hear that you got feedback that people are laying the groundwork now to talk to their communities and, and discuss the importance of resilience investments now. You know, again, back to that point from the beginning, uh, where I, I mentioned that 80% of bond uh, referendums submitted to voters last year were approved. You know, part of that is because certainly in, uh, voters understand the importance of infrastructure. Part of that is because of the hard work uh, local government leaders do every day, both building financial credibility, but also explaining the need for these projects to their communities. And, you know, that, that was not by accident. And so the projects that are submitted to voters are ones that have already, to some extent, been vetted, and you have community alignment around them. So I think it's it's interesting that uh, that leadership cohort that's done so well in building support for road improvements and school improvements and other things is now turning its attention to resiliency. Um, one other thing I'll mention before I hand over to, to Robert is that there was a, another piece of research that came out just in the last couple of weeks. It was from Hilltop Securities. Uh, Tom Koslick, who's an analyst over there, does an annual survey of municipal bond analysts. And one of the questions they asked was about forecasts and outlook for new money uh, or new issue municipal bond issuance over the next decade. And a majority of the respondents thought that issuance would average more than $500 billion a year over the next decade. Now, again, if you go back and look at that slide we had uh, at the beginning, it has never actually reached $500 billion yet. Um, so there is a lot, strong consensus in the municipal bond investment community that they are going to be called upon to provide more capital. And again, it goes back to this slide that that resiliency investments are crucial, they're needed, and they're going to be funded out of local capital budgets, 
which will ultimately be supported with municipal bonds. So uh, this is something the market is gearing up for, ready to support city leaders as you go forward. And so uh, something that uh, we'll keep a, a very close eye on in the coming years. So with that, um, you know, as, as Farhad mentioned, there is a minority of communities that have uh, undergone or undertaken these investments so far. We're lucky to have Robert Pattison from uh, Morgan Stanley, who worked on one of the biggest uh, standalone resiliency improvement projects uh, in the country. And he'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, what was learned from that. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as, as Michael said at the outset, my name is Rod Pattison. I'm the co-head of the public sector group here at Morgan Stanley. I've been in the municipal securities industry for over 20 years. Uh, so I was the lead banker for the, uh, as a, on behalf of Morgan Stanley, for the Battery Park City Authority's 2019 and 2023 bond sales. So um, as Michael said, there was 349 million of sustainability bonds. That was in 2023. We also did another 76 in 2019. So total, we've done 425 million of sustainability bonds on behalf of the Battery Park City Authority. And I'll just say that these were a parts of larger financial plans. Uh, so in, in total, we did $1.4 billion worth of bonding on behalf of the Battery Park City Authority uh, in, in uh, those two bond instruments is 1923. The sustainability bonds uh, was a big part of their 2019 sale for it, that sale being recognized by the bond buyer as the 2019 Northeast deal of the year in their deal of the year category. So um, again, as I said, I'm the lead, I was the lead banker on behalf of Morgan Stanley for the, the Battery Park City Authority. So what I'm about to tell you is these are my opinions. Um, I would best reach out to the, the, the team over at the Battery Park City Authority for any other clarifications, but I will do the best I can based on how uh, my working with them on, on, on all their goals. So if you'd like to learn more about the Battery Park City Authority, they have their website. They also have an investor site on uh, the BondLink platform. There's lots of information about their sustainability bond the resiliency plan and uh, whatnot. So um, for those who don't know, and I know Michael knows because he's down there right now, the Battery Park City is in the lower western uh, part of Manhattan. And it's right there on the Hudson River. So it's it's got uh, water exposure. Um, I think a lot of the genesis of why they did sustainability bonds was October 2012. And that's when Superstorm Sandy hit uh, the, the tri-state area and Manhattan in general. And, and there was a lot of damage to the Battery Park City area. So uh, there was damage to the, the PRA Harbor House. They have ball fields there. Those got flooded with a storm surge that came in. Um, there's a, a, a community center called the Asphalt Green Community Center that had damage. So a lot of the storm surge um, had adversely affected their community. So um, I think it's a large part because of that storm, the Battery Park City Authorities uh, developed a sustainability plan to protect that city um, from climate re related damage uh, going forward. And primarily they're looking at um, storm events and sea level rise or, or uh, river rise, which is right there on the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, so, but as I said, Battery Park City, and thus the authority who governs it is just part of uh, Manhattan. And there's an overall view of how to protect uh, Manhattan. So they are part of the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project. And if you look at the official statements of, of the bonds, they, they'll talk a bit about that project and, and their piece in there. So, you know, water rushes to the areas of least resistance. So if they protect, you know, they, water could go to other areas. So they are part of that. So the projects that we help them finance, and they, we use their existing bonding structure for that, is... Um, primarily continuous flood barriers uh, along their city and uh, modified landscape. So, um, so the areas when, they, when we first worked with them in 2019 to establish this, uh, they, they designated four different projects. They had the northern part of the city uh, area, the ball fields, again, which had se severe damage during the storm, uh, the western part of the city, uh, Battery Park City, and then the southern part. Um, since that time, and this is captured in 23 bond offering statements, they've merged some of the projects. So now um, the ball fields project, they, they deemed that done. That was done in 2021. And really at this point, they're down to the, a, a combined Northwest project and, and a Southern project uh, in terms of their, what they're looking at. So some of the things they've been focused on is a uh, pile repair. Uh, that's along the, the river, uh, utility relocation, so trying to get these above elevated levels where water could rush in. Drainage, so I, I saw Farhad, I mentioned uh, water and wastewater infrastructure was a core uh, issue of infrastructure that gets damaged during these events. So drainage repairs was part of it. 
and I, I mentioned the, the community center. So they're looking at waterproofing that community center that they have there. So, um, so if you go, if you go down there, they're, they're, ama they're amazing team at the battery proximity authority. They, they have uh, teams that can give you tours. Um, one of the, I, I have been on their tours down there. One thing that's really interesting is the, the light posts that are along the sidewalk down there, uh, generally painted black. Uh, what they've done is they painted blue uh, up to on, on those light posts where the 100 levels, like the 100 year storm um, watermark is just to show people where that is going to be. So it, it's, it's pretty daunting when you walk in, you see it's, it's taller than you walking through that area. So um, it's, a, it's a great thing just to visualize if you're touring that part of Battery Park City Authority to see that. And if you go on a tour, uh, again, they will show you these things. So they are active right now in construction. I, I defer to Michael, he's there right now, but I'm sure if he looks out, he could see the construction there. They are changing the parks uh, in terms of giving them a, a bit of a rise to protect them um, against uh, uh, storm uh, water rise. Um, so overall, that's the, the project. We also, as I said at the outset, we did a lot of other things as part of the financing. It just wasn't just this. They have other infrastructure needs that weren't sustainability bonds. We financed that as part of this. We also refinanced a lot of their existing debt um, as part of that. And uh, their view was it wasn't uh, probably the best value to go back and try to isolate where those original projects for sustainability, which means it has a green as well as a social outcome. So all the refinancing we did, it was not a labeled sustainability bond. So uh, with that, uh, Michael, uh, I'll pause there, see if any of you or any others have questions. Yeah, you, you got to the point that I was just gonna ask about is is what was a, a sustainability bond? And you mentioned that it's it's a bond that's labeled because of the service. And um, sustainability bonds are still, they've become much more common, I would say the last two years, how did that perform in terms of, did that help attract additional investors? And again, uh, as a reminder to the audience, so the Q&A panel is open. Please feel free to, to weigh in with your own questions. Yeah, so, uh, well, I would say part of it is we had to change the offering <clears throat> statement um, as well. Uh, we, it was a top to bottom uh, redo, uh, working with the authority and their legal team and their advisors to really convey these points of what they were trying to achieve and, and talk more about the city and their projects. And um, they had an outside uh, sec, uh, opinion on, on the sustainability in nature uh, through sustain, sustainalytics uh, on, on the sustainability bonds piece there. Um, but yeah, we did track through the order period uh, if there were new investors and people who were um, attracted by the designation. So we did follow through and, and provide that information, the investor information to the authority. We also had, um, it's, a, it's an infrequent issuer in the state of New York. So um, people get attracted by the Battery Park City Authority. It's, it's a natural AAA from Moody's and Fitch. So um, a lot of retail investors came in again, and a lot of the retail investors are also attracted to, um, they, they invest for an impact. They like to see these kinds of impacts. So uh, that happened as well. Great, and just uh, in case people on the uh, call are not familiar, uh, Build American Mutual in addition to bond insurance, which is our main uh, purpose. We also provide green bond evaluations for our members. If you're selling bonds that qualify as green bonds, there's a whole definition set out by the International Capital Market Association. Um, that's something you can visit our website at buildamerica.com to learn more about and certainly uh, reach out if you have any questions about whether your transaction might be eligible for that. We provide that as a free service. Again, you know, the, the green bond market is still a little bit uh, on the small side. It's a little difficult to prove that you're going to save money by sale, selling green bonds on any given issue. Uh, so that's a not no cost, uh, really just a transparency enhancement for your, your investors, if that's something you choose to do. Um, Farhad, you know, I was, was wondering if I could just go back to you with a question. You know, you have one of your slides, you talked about um, incorporating climate data into capital planning. And I was wondering if you could just give us a little more sense of what that looks like. What, How would that potentially impact decisions? No, oh, absolutely. So um, basically, when, when a government, let's just Look at, look at it this way. All governments do capital budgeting to some extent, right? But some of these governments were at the forefront of actually caring too much about resiliency of their infrastructure. They do actually take the costs associated with these plans and this, this uh, the, the uh, what is it called? The, the strategies, different strategies that will affect in the long term 
there is the, their infrastructure and the maintenance of their infrastructure into accounts. Okay, so I'm talking about not just a CIP, capital improvement plan. I'm talking about they actually have a master plan for the next decade or so, the next 20 years, let's say. Not just that, some of these governments do have a res resiliency manager or director, okay? Not majority of them, of course, that, that we surveyed, but some of these governments do have a position just for the, for, for the sake of taking care of resiliency aspect of their infrastructure. It's not just a public works director. It's not just a finance director. They actually embedded in their governments that position. So all of these, that, that investment will pay off, of course, a couple of years down the road when the cost of their maintenance is one third of a similar government without this position, without this uh, forward thinking, basically. The funny thing is, and, and I'm gonna, gonna just channel into our next flagship report that will come out in July, look forward for, for, to that state of the cities research. As part of that, this is just a tease of data I'm gonna share with you here, is we asked mayors about their uh, their their major most most important priorities for the fiscal year 2024. Economic development is number one, and infrastructure is number two. But funny when we ask the same question, but this time took into account the data we collected from Twitter and other social media to gauge the public interest. Infrastructure was number one, and energy and resiliency and environment was number two. So. Both categories of infrastructure, especially resiliency and environment from the viewpoint of the public was number two. This is interesting because we are at the cross section where governments are realizing that public actually is starting to care about the long term aspects of their cities, their environment and all of that. Right. So as we move forward, my expectation would be governments will more and more invest in this area in a sense that 10 years from now, hopefully we will see many positions similar to what we saw this year with regard to, I don't know, a resiliency director or a master plan just for resiliency aspect of their infrastructure in many governments. So that was a very, very positive thing that we are actually observing as part of the next project that, I, that we are doing. Thanks. We've got uh, sneak peeks of all kinds of data today. Sure. So with that, the last call to the audience, if there are any questions, please enter them in the panel. Otherwise, I'm going to thank our speakers today, Farhad uh, Omer and Rob Pattison. Uh, really great conversation. Um, something that obviously is going to be of, of more discussion for city leaders across the country in the coming years. Um, we will follow up uh, and provide that link to the full report when it's available via email. So thank you for joining us again today and have a great afternoon.